Okay. Well, so while you're working uh, this weekend on the solar system formation, today what I wanted to do is talk to you a little bit about uh, something that's ha been happening recently in astronomy, which I find to be the most amazing thing in the world, is that we are finding solar systems outside of our own. We're finding stars that have planets that orbit around them. And we now know of thousands of solar systems uh, out there and it turns out that a lot of them aren't like ours and so what we're going to do today is look at some of the other types of solar systems that we have and then after you do your solar system activity and after the exam we can come back and try to fold that all together to try to figure out what's really going on uh, but it's a pretty exciting time to be around in astronomy uh, because we have uh, these thousands and thousands of other solar systems we're finding and these other solar systems include planets like our own earth uh, which is exciting to me because my whole dream is to find life somewhere else in the galaxy and we're getting closer and closer every day. So what I would like to do is talk a little bit about something I call the search for Earth, looking at all of the planets that we know of out there to figure out which ones are the most Earth-like and uh, talk about how close we are to finding other planets that might be like our own. Uh, and it's, uh, it is an exciting time. We uh, just had uh, at the American Astronomical Society meeting for the very first time, they're starting to find uh, planets that you can really classify as Earth-like. They're the right distance from the star, they're the right size, and uh, now we're trying to chase down what the composition of their atmospheres are to see if we can figure out if they have liquid water at the surface which would truly make it an earth-like world uh, and then once we know that those are there we can think of other ways we might study them uh, and maybe even someday possibly visit them if we uh, if we are so inclined to do so either with robotic probes or or maybe someday we'll go ourselves Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, you know some of the questions I love about this is that uh, you know, everybody dreams of going to the stars, everybody can ask these questions, and probably since the beginning of time, these were the three most important questions that any human being asked when they looked up at the night sky. They could ask, where did we come from? You know, I'm, I'm here on Earth, I was the Earth here before I got here? Uh, will it be here after I'm, after I'm gone? Uh, are we alone in the universe? Are there other planets that have creatures like me that someday I might communicate with? Um, and also, where are we going? Or is there a chance that we might someday explore or visit uh, these worlds that we're talking about? And the, the crazy thing is, is that these questions were largely philosophy questions up until about 20 years ago. And about 15, 20 years ago, we started to make some really awesome experimental discoveries about the nature of life, its origin, uh, where life came from on the planet Earth, and we're also starting to find other Earth-like planets in the galaxy, and we may be able to answer the question, second question, are we the only planet with life, or are there other planets that have life? And we have a space program that has visited other planets. Now, granted, we've only been to the moon and we've only sent robots to other planets, uh, but we do have the technological capability to leave the planet Earth if we're willing to do so. And so these three questions that were philosophy for the last 5,000 years are now active areas of scientific research and engineering, which is an exciting time to be around in astronomy. So this is just from the American Astronomical Society meeting that I just went to. I promised you I would bring you the results and here they are for exoplanet research. As of this month we have 763 confirmed planets around other stars. That means we've managed to measure their mass and orbital characteristics. Uh, we have an additional 3468 candidates. Now we'll talk about those a little bit later but those are planets where we've only managed to measure their radius and so we don't know their mass. So they could be really small stars like white dwarfs or some Something else, uh, but they're candidates for planets because they have the right size. Uh, of all of these candidates and confirmed planets, uh, almost over 350 of them are less than the size of the Earth, and uh, 1,800 of them are less than twice the size of the Earth. So that means we're finding planets that, at least in terms of their size, we could categorize as Earth like. Um, they're the same size as the Earth. And a few of these are in areas uh, around their star that we would call habitable. And by habitable, we just mean uh, the planet is in the right distance from the sun that it could have liquid water at the surface. Um, now, that's a very narrow definition of habitability because it precludes the idea of subsurface oceans on, say, icy moons around Jupiter where there could be life, uh, subsurface on Mars and things like that. But just in terms of does this planet have continents and oceans like the Earth? Uh, there's a few of them that fall into that category, although we can't be sure yet. We haven't characterized their atmospheres, but just a few of them. Uh, so 
so this is an exciting time because what this means is is we're just now starting to get a handle on what the frequency of these things are and the uh, the most recent data that we have suggests that there are if based on these observations that there are something like 40 billion uh, well of the 40 billion stars uh, there's something like uh, most of those will have uh, some kind of earth-like planet around it so if you consider uh, you know the uh, the, the frequency of these things, the likelihood of there being Earth-like planets around other stars are really, really common, uh, really high. If you want to check out this web... Oh, yeah, go for it, Shay. What's up? Um, so are we saying that life can only be sustained uh, based on the fact that it has water on the planet? That's the... Or, yeah, yeah, go for it. Or can life be sustained otherwise? I mean, do have we been able to... Um, uh, test that or say that that's a true statement that we you know life can only be sustained due to um, water on the planet well the only statement we can make is that every place we find liquid water we find life on earth um, if there's an area on earth we where we don't find liquid water that we don't find anything alive there so so that's what makes this connection at least on the planet earth that water equals life uh, but you raise a really interesting question is there a type of life out there that could use something else other than water and the answer to that question is we have no idea um, but because we have no idea we have no idea how to look for it and so we wouldn't recognize it if we saw it so we're starting with this limited definition uh, totally recognizing that there could be other types of life out there and we're open to finding them if we you know if we send a probe to the moon of Saturn called Titan uh, and they have liquid methane there and there's life moving around in liquid methane we'll be more than happy to call it life when we see it but we don't we don't know of anything like that at the moment so so that's why we limit ourselves to to liquid water at the surface although it is limiting it really is um, although we'll find out later though that the most common elements in the universe that make up regular matter are hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. And our life tends to be uses water H2O and carbon. And those are really common. So so that's another reason why we, we don't mind looking for it because they're so common in the universe, these elements, that if our life uses them, then some other form of life probably will too. But I would like to keep an open mind. But great right. question, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, go. Do you have another question, Shay? No, that's it. Okay. Um, but, you know, Shay, if you get a chance, check out this website called exoplanets.org. They have. Uh, uh, you can take all these planets and look at all their different characteristics. And one of the things that would be an interesting research project, I think, is to, uh, if you wanted to expand this idea of the possibilities of life, I think most scientists would probably tell you that the one thing you absolutely need for life is some kind of solvent to move stuff around. Like you got to be able to get the food from one side of the organism to another. So there has to be some kind of fluid. Um, you could go through this catalog and look at what are the surface temperatures on these planets and what are the liquid temperatures of different solvents and make a catalog of planets that have, uh, you know, maybe they could have an ocean of hydrogen peroxide or an ocean of ammonia or something like that. And at, if nothing else, that would be a catalog of if we ever do find life living in ammonia ammonia we would know where to look for it so that would be a that would be a cool research project to do all right so that's where we are uh, and and again i'm just going to say this is the most amazing thing that's happened uh, in astronomy as far as i'm concerned for the last decade is that we've gone from knowing of eight planets in our own solar system to uh four thousand in in the in the galaxy and that's just the ones we found there's actually billions of them but we haven't found them all so so planets exist around other stars there are planets that we would call earth-like and i think we're on track uh, within the next decade to be able to answer the question is there life on any of these planets um, what we want to talk about though in astronomy is how we find these planets because it's uh, it's a really clever uh, couple of techniques that we use because the star is so bright we can't see it directly I mean it's like if you imagine if I bring this lamp here it's really bright and if I put something very small next to it you're not gonna be able to see it because it's just gonna get washed out by the light of the lamp uh, the stars are so bright and the planets are so close to the stars that we don't have uh, the ability to detect the planets directly in almost all cases so we have to look at the planets influence on the star uh, with gravity uh, and look at the motion of the star and the motion of the star will tell us whether or not a planet is there. So we've got a couple of large telescopes we use. Uh, these are the Keck telescopes you can see uh, right, right here. 
These are 10 meter class telescopes. This is a this is a Keck one and Keck two. These things are about the size of a small. Uh, you know, if you imagine uh, this is so this is 30 meters across. Actually, more like 50 meters across here. So this is 50 meters. These are big telescopes. Um, well, I guess that's no. It's about 30 meters across. The telescope inside is about 10 meters across. So that's the telescope. These things are big telescopes, and we use those to detect the faint. Uh, the, the light from these stars and then we watch this light um, uh, to get the spectrum to, to determine whether or not uh, the planet the, the star is moving and the way that we tell whether a star is moving is through something called the Doppler effect and I should I, I meant to bring that up when we missed our session last time so let's talk a little bit about the Doppler effect we use something known as the Doppler effect to tell if these stars are moving so we're looking at the the motion of the star the gravitational influence of the star on the planet uh, or the planet on the star and if the star is moving we can tell that a planet is tugging on it and this thing called the Doppler effect changes the frequency of light in the spectrum and I'll have a picture of this later but it changes the frequency of light so that if we're looking at a spectrum the spectrum shifts back and forth as this star moves around we can tell its motion so again we're looking for the influences that the planet has on the star and if we think about how we might do that, uh, we have to introduce something called the center of mass. And this is a concept you may be familiar with. Uh, I was in Seattle uh, for uh, a research meeting, and I found this on the beach. Uh, this is uh, uh, some driftwood, and some folks were just playing around, and they put rocks on, on this thing and logs until they got it to balance. And they were talking about uh, you know, trying to find the center of mass of this thing. And if they know that if they balance this, that the mass over here has to be equal to the mass over here that has to balance and if I put more mass on this side then this balance point has to shift to the right to make it balance uh, and if I put more mass on the other side I have to shift it to the left to balance it and the center of balance means that not only on earth will something have to rest on a on a balance point but even orbits orbits of planets if you've got two massive objects they will not orbit one orbiting the center of the other they will both orbit a common center of mass so these things will orbit a common center of mass uh, and cause the the motion uh, of one of them to shift relative to the other one and I've got a picture of that right here you can imagine if you've got a uh, a star and a little planet they're going to orbit a common center of mass and that common center of mass is going to be right about here because that's the place where they're both orbiting so you can see that when the star is here it's closer to the center of mass than the planet would be which is farther away because the planet is less massive and so this is uh, uh, this this planet here the blue thing is causing the star to orbit the center of mass now for the most part uh, in in planetary systems you can't see the planet you can only see the star but the star is still going to orbit that center of mass and so we can track the motion of that center of mass if the two things happen to be equal in mass then they're going to orbit the same distance away if we have something like a planet the center of mass is going to be really close to the star so you're just going to get a little wobble due to the star uh, the, in the star due to the planet just a little teeny tiny wobble as it bounces around but it's something that's detectable and with this we can determine the mass and the orbit uh, when we make this measurement using Newton's laws we can determine both the distance that the planet is and we can also determine the mass of the planet from this little motion of the star around the center of mass oh. John, I didn't know that. So the sun moves in an orbit as well? Yeah, yeah. And this is something that uh, Kepler didn't know this. Um, he just thought the sun was fixed in space. But as soon as Newton came up with his equal and opposite laws, that made it so that the sun had to respond to the motion of the planet. Um, to give you an idea of how small this effect is, though, um, the motion, the velocity of the sun due to Jupiter's tugging on it is about 10 meters per second. So if you imagine like walking across your living room in one second, that's how fast the sun is moving. So it's a very small effect, uh, but it's big enough that we can detect it with our telescopes. Okay. And, it, and again, so it, what we're doing is we're using like our gravity eyeballs <laughs> because we can, we're not, we're not, we don't see the planet itself. The planet itself is completely invisible because it's too close to the star. And instead we just see the star bounce back and forth 
and that tells us that the planet has to be there. Oh, okay. Uh, I see. And it only gives you, you can tell from how long it takes to bounce back and forth what the period is of the planet. Uh, so, because they have to orbit like this, right? And so if it takes, uh, if the star goes around its center of mass in, say, 100 days, then the planet has to go around the center of mass in 100 days. So you know the period of the planet, and you can use Kepler's laws to get the, to get the distance. Uh, and then because of the, uh, the velocity of the star, you can get the mass of the planet, because the, the, the bigger the mass of the planet, the faster the star has to go around. Uh, and the reason for that is if I make this planet bigger, like if I make this twice the size, this thing moves out, the orbital period is the same, but that means this is bigger, so it has to move faster to get around the circle in the same amount of time. Oh, I guess. Okay. So it's so it's it's a pretty cool technique, and it's something that people uh, had thought about. They'd used it on binary stars a bunch, but they had thought about planets, and they said, well, nobody will ever be able to observe 10 meters per second velocity of a star. Uh, but now we're observing one meter per second um, and finding Earth-like planets. Um, so how do we detect the motion of these stars? Uh, there's a couple different ways. The first one is just watch on the sky. You know, the simplest thing you can imagine. You take pictures and watch the star move. Um, the problem with that is that the star doesn't move very much on the sky, so you probably need a space-based telescope to do it. And if you think about it, it takes, you know, if this is the astrometry techniques most sensitive to far out planets, so if it takes 11 years for Jupiter to go around the Sun, you'd have to wait 11 years before you'd know you'd had a full orbit. And that's a long time to wait to find a planet. Um, so we uh, so we try some different techniques. The Doppler effect is where we use the the shift of the spectrum. So we look at the uh, uh, the the spectrum of the star, you know, the rainbow of the star, and it'll shift back and forth uh, due to this Doppler technique, this Doppler effect, uh, as the as the star uh, goes around uh, in its orbit. Now the Doppler effect, you can think about that like. Um, if you've ever gone to, uh, well, let's take the, the jet planes that come across the Wasatch Front. As they're coming towards us from hill, they have a really high pitch, and as they fly past you, their pitch gets lower. And the reason for that is because they're compressing the waves in front of them and the, the sound waves, and the sound waves behind them are getting stretched out. And so for that very same reason, uh, the uh, the Doppler effect uh, does that for light. It, it, if it's moving towards you, it compresses the waves towards you and it makes it bluer and if it's moving away from you it expands the waves and makes it redder and I've got a picture of that in just a second. Uh, the last way we measure these uh, planets is is something called transit where we you know if you imagine the star right here you just wait for the planet to go in front of the star and while you can't resolve the star and the planet you can measure the total brightness and if you take a planet and put it in front of the star the brightness goes down and you can track that. So that transit technique is a way to get the size. Uh, it doesn't give you the mass, but it does give you the size. Uh, so here's some examples of these techniques. So this is astrometry. This is a star called Barnard Star, and it's moving uh, because of a binary companion, not a not a uh, planet. Uh, but you can see here that it takes from. Let's see if I can back this up and play it again. It takes from 2000 May 2000 to June, September, May 2002, so it moved a very small amount in two years, and it hasn't even gone through a complete orbit. So we can, we can measure astrometry, but it's, you have to be pretty patient. Um, the Doppler effect is something that's a lot easier to measure uh, because we can, uh, it's, it's much more sensitive to close-in planets uh, because the, uh, uh, they, can, they, they create a bigger velocity on the star. Uh, and so here's an example of what that looks like. If I've got a star that is moving because of a, a planet around it, and let's say it's moving in this direction, and you're over here observing it, here's your eyeball observing this thing, uh, the planets, or the star is moving this way because the planet is causing it to move around its center of mass, and when it's coming towards you, the light waves get compressed, and so that means that the wavelength of the light is shorter and that means it's bluer. So we get bluer light on this side. And uh, when it's moving away from you, right, if, if, it's, uh, if you're over here observing it, it's moving away from you, which means that the wavelength between the peaks is bigger, and so this is redder. And so what we get is if we make a graph of this uh, velocity that we're measuring from this redshift as a function of time, if this is zero, 
in other words at rest it goes like this positive negative positive negative positive negative so it's moving uh, towards you here and away from you over here So those waves get bigger as it goes away from you, right? Yeah, they stretch out. So this this, this right here, uh, well, I should say, uh, so this is its velocity, right? So this is the velocity we measure. So uh, if it's moving faster, this gets bigger like this, right? But the period depends on the planet as it's moving away, or, or the, the period depends on how big the how, big, how far away the planet is from the star because that determines the orbital period. Um, but if we look at the wavelength, so this is over here, this is the wavelength lambda as a function of x. Over here, there's more gaps or more distance between the peaks than over here. It's closer. It's closer, right? So this is a bluer, bluer wavelength and this is a, a redder wavelength. And so this sort of... Uh, this this stretching and compression of the of the light wave is what we're measuring, and the nice thing is is uh, you can measure it uh, directly. You just point your telescope at the star. You don't have to wait for you know to wait to see the star move. You see it in the spectrum. Uh, the only problem is it only measures the wave the the velocity towards or away from you. So if the planet happens to be tilted 90 degrees to you and is going like making the star go like this. Uh, you won't detect anything because there's no motion towards or away from you. It's just all in the plane of the sky. And so there's an ambiguity about whether there's a tilt to this planet, and that sets a, a limit on what we can say, but we get a pretty good estimate of the mass anyway. And then the last one is transit, and this is the one where you know you just wait for a little planet to transit in front of the star, and it uh, makes the light dim. And if you you might not be able to see that on the on your screen, so I'll draw it too. So here there's a planet located right there that's crossing the screen, and when this planet goes in front of the star like this, what you get is the brightness as a function of time. It starts high, and then as soon as the planet crosses the star, it goes down until it gets back on the other side of the star. And so you get a drop in brightness of the star because you're in transit. And the cool thing about that is that the the amount of brightness you drop tells you the area of the star, so it gives you the si or the area of the planet, so it gives you the size, and the width uh, tells you uh, how long it takes to transit the star, and then how frequently these transit happens tells you the period of the orbit. So you can get uh, everything but the mass this way. You can get the size and you can get the, the time it takes the planet to go around the star. Um, and you can only estimate the mass by saying, well, if it's an Earth size, I'll just assume it has an Earth's density and I'll calculate the mass from that. All right, so those are the techniques. And I want to talk a little bit about the transit method because uh, the workhorse telescope that's been working for the last four or five years is one called Kepler. And its whole job was to stare at the same spot of the sky and measure these transits for about 100,000 stars. And they were trying to do a survey to catalog uh, a group of stars and just ask the question, how common are planets of different sizes. And this is the instrument. It's a space-based instrument. It can measure changes in brightness to one part in a million. Uh, which is pretty remarkable if you think about it. That would be like if I take a wire and put it in front of a light source and then I increase the current in the wire a little bit which causes the wire to get a little bit fatter which you would never see with your eye. This telescope could detect that little extra thickness blocking the light. Uh, so it's a very sensitive instrument and it's operated for the last four years uh, taking these, uh, these observations. And the place on the sky where it looks, uh, you can fire up Stellarium to see where this is. It's usually only visible in the summertime. Uh, there's a constellation called Cygnus, and it's in the in the plane of the galaxy. We wanted to look in the plane of the galaxy because that's where most of the stars are. And, but we also wanted to not get obscured by all the dust in the galaxy, so we shifted the Kepler field of view off a little bit. And so what you're looking at here is the uh, area of the sky that Kepler looks at. So it's looking at 100,000 stars all in that area. And then these are the footprints of the various detectors on the sky. So these are all little uh, camera elements that just take pictures uh, of little pieces of the sky. And all this thing does is stare at these 100,000 stars over and over and over again looking for these little dips because the planets passed in front of the stars. Um, when they first pushed the, put, pointed this thing at the sky, we knew of three 
um, planets in the field of view. Uh, and Kepler found those because we knew they were there. We wanted to verify that the instrument worked and there were three planets in the field of view. Uh, after a couple of years of observation, uh, after one year of observation, it looked like this. We had a thousand planetary candidates. So I don't know if you can see that on your screen, but I'll do that again. Uh, we went from having three to a thousand. And now this is what it looks like. This is the most recent uh, map they've released as of last year, uh, which shows the locations of the Kepler candidates. And this represents about 2,500 of the 3,400 candidates. Uh, so in other words, uh, I want you to think about this for a minute. <laughs> Go back to this piece of the sky. Cygnus is uh, about the size of your hand on the sky. So if you were to hold up your hand, it would cover the Cygnus, the Swan constellation. Just off to the right of that is going to be the Kepler field of view. Every time you put your hand up to the sky, you're covering this many planets, stars with planets. So there's 3,400 planets. You put up your hand on the sky, you're covering 3,400 planets. Uh, it's a remarkable number, especially when you consider how many hands you can place across the sky. Uh, we have uh, effectively determined that there are billions of planets in the galaxy. There's a couple of other interesting things that's, that's happened, though, because not only have we found new planets, we found planets we never knew, types of planets we never knew existed. So uh, in this graph, we've got these things color-coded. So we've got the Earth-sized ones. So every place you see a blue dot is an Earth. Now, it might not be at the right distance from the star. It could be too close or too far away, but at least it's an Earth size. Uh, all the orange ones are Neptune size, and all the red ones are Jupiter size. But there's this type of planet, these super-Earths, that we've never seen before. We don't have any example of these super-Earths in our solar system. There are Earth, Earths, we think they're rocky planets, that are between uh, 1.25 and 2 Earth sizes. So it's a new class of planet that we've never seen before. And we really don't know if they're super-Earths, like just bigger Earth-like planets, or if they're mini-Neptunes, like just like Neptune, but smaller. And that's something that people are trying to figure out. Um, just for comparison by number, um, so we the, so you want to know how how common these things are. Um, these super Earths are the second most common type of planet that we have. Now, uh, Kepler is still looking for planets, and this one is this uh, Earth-sized planet is likely to still go up. So we probably will find more Earth-like planets, Earth-sized planets. Uh, but these relative numbers between Jupiter or between Neptune and the super-Earths are, are pretty accurate, which means that the super-Earths are almost as common as Neptune's. So it's kind of strange. We have two Neptune-like planets in our solar system. We have Uranus and Neptune. Um, according to these statistics, we should have at least one, if not two, super-Earths in our solar system, and we don't have one. So we've never seen what these things look like. And it's an entirely new class of planet. And uh, we just published a paper on whether or not these super-Earths might be a better place to have life than an Earth-like planet because of several characteristics. They might have more water, they might have more uh, surface area, things like that. Uh, but it's exciting because it's this entirely new, uh, uh, new area of research. Now, that's fine to find Earth-sized planets, but what we really want are Earth-like planets. And so we're looking for planets that are in the, what's called the habitable zone of our star system. And what this graphic is showing you is the relative distance of the place around the star where you can have liquid water at the surface. And so if you look at, uh, you know, this is a sun-like star right here. This is the Earth. This green area represents the place where you can have liquid water at the surface, where you're not too close or too far away from the star. Out here, you would be ice covered. In here, you're too hot, right? So we call it the Goldilocks zone because Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold, Earth is just right. Uh, if you go to a brighter star, it moves out, but also gets a little bit bigger, right? So this is the habitable zone out here, the hab zone. Around a brighter star, it moves out because the star is hotter. Bluer star is hotter, uh, but it does get slightly wider. And then cool stars, you can still have a habitable zone closer in, uh, but it gets a little narrower. So this is representing the real estate that we have available to us. And we have found some planets in the habitable zone. Uh, OK, so 
what are some of the expectations that uh, that I expect to see? I'd hoped to see these for the American Astronomical Society, but I did not. Um, I'd have to wait till the next one. Uh, but some of the expectations are things that are right out of science fiction. Um, one of them is, uh, oh wait, hang on. One of them is a uh, moon of a giant planet in the habitable zone. So this is a picture of, uh, this is the Pandora from Avatar, right? We've got the moon of this gas giant around Alpha Centauri. Uh, this is a possibility. We're looking for these moons right now. Uh, we find Jupiter mass planets in the habitable zones of other stars. The question is, could they have moons large enough uh, to sustain liquid water and life? And then this is the forest moon of Endor uh, from Star Wars. So these are, these are places that uh, could exist that we're looking for moons of other planets uh, that happen to be in the habitable zone. So once we go out and find all these planets, we'd like to characterize them, and uh, the, that's going to require some next generation telescopes. And what we're looking at here is a really clever idea for getting the light directly from the planet itself. We haven't found, uh, we haven't directly detected the light from the planet. It's always been the gravitational influence of the planet on the star. Uh, but if you could block out the starlight, we have telescopes powerful enough to detect the planet. It's just that the star is too bright. So the concept here is you would have a free-flying occulting disk, basically a giant star shade that you could, that you could cover the starlight with. Uh, it's as simple a concept as holding out your thumb and covering a bright street lamp. Uh, the challenge is, is that in order to make the geometry work out right, this thing has to be a couple kilometers across and it has to be located uh, thousands, 100,000 kilometers from you. Uh, so the idea is we would fly these two instruments. One would be a telescope and the other one would be this star shade. And then when they aligned properly to look at a certain star, we would use the telescope to look at the star. And then while the star shade was going to its next location, we'd use the telescope to do other stuff. That's the working concept of something that could fly in, in a, a not too long from now, like maybe five or 10 years. Um, Northrop Grumman has been working on uh, an instrument called the uh, James Webb Space Telescope, and that's the telescope that could act as the telescope that looks at the starshade. Uh, and if this works, you would be able to see uh, the planets around the star because you'd have this starshade that would just block out the light from the star, and you could see the existence of planets. And if we could do that, if we can get light from the planet itself, you could determine the composition of the atmosphere. And if you knew the composition of the atmosphere, you could determine whether or not that planet has life. And that's something I expect to see within the next uh, decade or so. Um, to give you a little idea of progress and predictions, though, uh, where we are, you know, when I started as an undergraduate of, uh, at the University of Iowa, uh, planets around other stars, we'd never we'd never found any and we didn't even talk about it in our astronomy class. People assumed they were there but we would never ever find them. Uh, when I graduated four years later we knew of 30 of them and now the number is, these numbers are a little out of date here because this was of 2011 but I showed you the numbers before. We're at 3400 plus 4000 or so stars uh, or planets with planets around other stars. So we've gone an amazing thing in the last 20 years going from uh, nothing to where we are now. Um, what I sort of expect to happen, you know, when Kepler launched in 2008, we didn't know of any Earth-like solar systems. And then in 2012, when they made their announcement, we've got about 350. So I'm making a prediction here that in the next six to seven years, uh, we will have something for this question mark here that says the number of planets with life. Uh, and that's just looking at the general trend of the way our technology has been improving and what we've been learning. I would not be surprised that by the end of uh, by the end of this decade, we should have at least some idea if there are any Earth-like planets out there that have any life on them. Uh, now, when I say life, I mean um, microbial life because that's the thing that interacts with the atmosphere the most. Um, for all I know, tomorrow we'll detect a signature from an intelligent species that's using radio emissions, but that's something we're going to talk about near the end of the class when we talk about intelligent life. Okay. So that's what I wanted to cover today about exoplanets, and uh, we're going to do more on this later when we talk about intelligent life in the universe, but for right now this gives us a sense of what the uh, spectrum of possibilities are uh, in, the, in the galaxy. So when you go back and look at your solar system activity, you can, 
you can look at the data from our planet, but you can also our planets, but you can also look at the data from other solar systems and see that we have this enormous amount of information now about the way solar systems form. And that's all I had today, unless there are questions. Um, so, can you explain uh, a moon one more time? Um, how do we determine it's a moon over a planet? Is that the size of the 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 moon or the planets? How do we determine it's a moon? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So this is kind of the it's the it's it's the same type of effect we use uh, to find the planet itself. Is that we look at the gravitational influence of the moon on the planet and how that affects the gravitational influence of the planet on the star. Um, and in fact, actually with transits, we can do it directly from the transit. So, so think about it this way. You're, you're, let's say you've got a planet without a moon and you have a, uh, a, a star right here. The planet comes in front of the star and makes an eclipse and then it does that every you know, 100 days or something like that. And if there's no moon around that planet, it's going to happen regular like clockwork. Every 100 days, it'll, you'll get a transit. If there's a moon, however, the planet and the moon are orbiting a common center of mass. So sometimes the moon will lead the planet, and sometimes the planet will lead the moon. And that's going to change when the transit occurs, because sometimes the planet shows up late, and sometimes the planet shows up early. And so that means the timing of the transit is going to shift back and forth, and that will tell you whether there's a moon there. Uh, the uh, the folks who are doing this study uh, were really interested in 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 making a discovery before the American Astronomical Society meeting, uh, but in their talk they said that they hadn't found one yet, but they had several candidates that they were still looking at. So uh, it's uh, it's going to happen eventually. They'll find one. It's just managing to uh, analyze the data and get the uh, the errors down enough that they can see what they're looking for. That's great. That's interesting. Yeah, for it's sure. uh, it's an exciting time. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about today is our exam, which is coming up. The exam is uh, is opening next Tuesday, and it'll be open until the following Friday evening, so you'll have most of the week to schedule it and get it done. Um, the uh, We'll have an exam review next Tuesday, and uh, that'll include some materials that you can use to help prepare for the exam. Uh, the exam will be held in the testing center uh, on any Weber State campus. It'll be held through Chi Tester, so you'll be uh, able to access that from any of the uh, campuses and if you're located more than 50 miles away from campus if you go to the link in our syllabus uh, you can get some accommodation for figuring out how to get a proctored exam there so if you look up here in our syllabus uh, where did I put that uh, yeah go to wsuonline.weber.edu this link right here 
and it gives some instructions to what happens if you happen to live more than 50 miles away.